Coming up next, learn how challenging firefighting can be. Discover how wire gets turned into art. Find out how riding in the sand became a full-time job. And understand what it takes to create these designs. It all starts now on FunAddicts.tv. Hi, I'm Joni. And I'm Rich. Today we visit one of our favorite festivals in our hometown, Fremont, California. It's not just one of our favorites. This is the largest street festival on the West Coast. It attracts 400,000 people each year. Many things bring them back. Great music, great food, and more than 700 artists and craftspeople. And for many years, the festival has featured the Western Regional Firefighter Combat Challenge. I'm looking forward to it. So am I. So let's get started. The Firefighter Combat Challenge is just one thing that makes the Fremont Festival of the Arts so special. There are many food booths, each of which benefits a local nonprofit group. The crowds are entertained on several stages, and children are able to enjoy many activities in their own kid zone. But since art is the festival's theme, you'll find hundreds of artists, including photographers, painters, carvers, and jewelry makers. Because the festival is so large, it's spread over four walking miles. Tell me, how did you get inspired to be sculpting with wire? Um, I was always a big fan of Alexander Calder. He's sort of the father of wire sculpture. And uh, so I'd seen his work all along. And then I just kind of stumbled into it um, by accident. We were messing around at a friend's house. We were cleaning up his yard. There were some short scraps of wire. And we we're just making little things out of two and three foot pieces. And uh, so the next week I bought a roll at the hardware store. And I made a face kind of like one of these. I gave it to my brother for his birthday. And that was kind of the end. I was back to time I was doing ceramics and photography and I live up in Chico and a guy that owned a local gallery saw the, this face at my brother's house said where did this come from I want to carry this work and so uh, so I went in and he said I want to start carrying your work and there was no work there was this one face but I said oh yeah I can do that <laughs> so uh, so it just sort of exploded from there on me so yeah it just kind of kind of fell on my lap so how long ago was that and where has it gone since then uh, that was a couple years ago and uh, since then, I sold my small business, and this is a full-time job, so. So do you primarily uh, share your work through festivals like this, or are there uh, other places? festivals, and then I have about a dozen galleries around Northern California, Southern Oregon, and I do commission work. So I'm trying to do a lot of different directions. It's still kind of early on in my career, and so I'm just trying different things, trying different festivals, uh, seeing what happens. Oh. I don't know if you can kind of show us while we're talking here, but what do you, how do you get the inspiration? I mean, you pick up a piece of wire and what do you see in it? Um, I mean, I see a lot of it's like thinking of an image and it's finding out, okay, what are the lines that sort of define that image in three dimensions? And so um, a little bit of it, it's, I mean, in, in some ways I refer to this work, it's almost two and a half dimensions because normally you take a one dimensional line and you draw on a two dimensional piece of paper or you take a two-dimensional surface, like a piece of clay or sheet metal, and you make a three-dimensional surface. And this, I'm kind of trying to cheat the whole dimensional plan where I'm going straight from one to three dimensions. And so you sort of end up, what I refer to as sort of two and a half dimensions, because it's, you know, it's almost three dimensions, but not quite in a way, so. Um, and so I, I'm thinking of anything, it's sort of, okay, which lines do I need to create as, as a piece moves around where you get the idea of it and and suggest your eye, have your eye always has to have something that's working at the moment. So if you've got, say, a, a figure, you may have two hands, and one hand may be flat like this, you just see a straight line, but the other hand's like this. So your eye goes to this hand if they're separated, and then as the figure turns, then this hand comes around and this hand disappears, your eye goes over there. So uh, the idea is that it keeps your eye moving around um, and it'll go to whatever's working at the moment and helps sort of define the piece and make it work for, for that. I think it's sort of that reptilian part of your brain is always jumping to whatever's working and keeps that part of it entertained. And So uh, do you ever repeat your pieces or do you keep track of them? Because, I mean, you're doing these all as one of a kind, right? Uh, I mean, each one's individual. I do repeat a lot of themes and um, certain poses on dancers and things I do. 
over and over again. And I feel like they always get a little bit better every time I improve. But yeah, I don't I don't necessarily keep track or keep photos because I'm in mean, a year I do hundreds of pieces, and so um, yeah, there's just no way to keep track of it. But I have certain themes I keep going back to, and then I come up with new ideas, and people come up with commissions for things I'd never thought of, and then that may become a standard piece. Or if it's you know something I'm not sure I'm going to sell all the time, then you know it'll just be I'll just do it as commission work. So. And what about the wire gauge? Do you use different thicknesses, or are you pretty I much use, consistent? Uh, yeah, I use uh, number 16 steel wire, just a standard rebar tie wire, any hardware store, and then I use eighth inch aluminum armature wire for the silver pieces. They sort of work differently. The black wire really needs a light background. It really pops out and feels like a line drawing in space. Um, the aluminum's better if you have dark walls or if you have, um, if you're hanging in front of a window, we have a busy background. It sort of has enough mass to uh, hold, you know, space itself in a situation like that. So, and different people are like different ones, and so those are the two things I use. And it looks like you use mostly your hands, very few tools. I use my hands and pliers, and that's it. Yeah. It's it's fascinating, and so you basically uh, confine your travels also to Northern California. Uh, pretty much, yeah, yeah. I'm just doing right now. I'm doing Northern California. Um, I might sort of, you know, look in other places a little bit, but uh, I can always ship work. But right now I've got plenty of market going on here. Northern California is a really good art market. And so I'm slowly sort of expanding out. I feel like once I sort of get Northern California, then I may hit L.A., go up to Portland, Seattle, stretch it out slowly. Well, for those people who aren't lucky enough to find you at a festival or at a gallery, how could they find out more information? Uh, you can get a hold of me. My website will be up in the next month is stenwire.com. Um, or you can just email or just Google Sten Hoyland, S-T-E-N-H-O-I-L-A-N-D, um, and I'm on the web, so you can find me through. Different galleries have stuff posted and images up, so you can always get a hold of me through that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Who would you consider yourself, a painter or an author? A painter. Yeah, a painter and a storyteller. Yeah. And so uh, when a picture paints a thousand words, tell me a little bit more about how your pictures paint words to you as an author. Well, I start with the words. So I'm actually, I'm an illustrator, but I like to, I like to be sure that I'm very much in touch with what the paint can do. In other words, I'm in very involved in, in the surface of the, of the painting as, as much as I am in trying to make a picture that explains the words on the page. So for me, I have a story. I'm an okay writer. I'm not a great writer. But with the painting, I feel really at home and I know I can expand that idea that's on the page so much more with the painting. So tell me, what's your inspiration behind your creativity? Hmm. Well, initially for the books that I've done, it was actually the desert. It was the Sonoran Desert in particular, which is this subtropical desert, two rainy seasons. It's the southern part of Arizona and the northern part of Mexico, and it's an extremely unique environment. And it's really beautiful, it's lush. And it's very dense with vegetation and wildlife, and I had never seen a desert like that before. I was taking a class in, in Mexico, a creativity course, Instructor gave us five minutes to write a funny story about a funny character with a funny name, and I wrote Zonk the Dreaming Tortoise. Now, Zonk the Dreaming Tortoise. Tell me a little bit about Zonk and how he came into your life and his adventures. Well, I think the fact that I was so, so inspired by that desert, and then I had this task to make this little character up, it was just automatic. This thing that was really working on my subconscious. I write a story about a Desert tortoise wants to be a sea turtle. And I think maybe it was just a Californian wanted to go back to the ocean, you know? So um, I'm not real conscious. I try not to be didactic about what the inspiration is. Um, I'm very struck by the Sonoran Desert. I think it's, uh, it's something that should be protected better than it's being protected. And I, since I've started doing this work, I go to a lot of scientific conferences. Um, land management conferences, the people that are actually doing the work, the people that are on the ground doing the work, protecting these animals, trying to, trying to make a difference, and I've learned a lot. And they've become uh, an inspiration too, to me too. And the second book 
has a section in the back of the book that explains how the characters in these books relate to the environment that they come out of and what their relationships are with one another. So even very small children, I mean, they understand that things are finite. You know, they need to be protected. So that's part of my inspiration. I'd like you to expand a little bit on that idea. So what would you like your readers to come away from with your writing? I noticed that your books are very colorfully illustrated and, and children are probably really attracted by that. But is there a lesson or a message that you would like for them to come away with? I don't think so. I don't think they're really didactic. I think they're fun stories. I, say, I try to stay honest in my artwork and in my stories. And what I mean by that is I'm not, I'm not writing something because I think it's going to sell and I'm not painting something because I think it's going to please you. Um, I do what I can with the, the skill and the talent that I have and try to stay true to my own vision. And if there's anything in my work, I think that's probably it. Stay true to your own vision. When I work with kids, I really try to make them understand that there's an idea and there's a finished product and all the work is in between. The idea is only an idea. And um, with older children, I actually have them look at my original draft with the editor's notes, with the editor's letter telling me I got a lot of work to do so that they really understand that it's a huge process. Nothing comes out of the oven fully done that you really have to work it and work it and work it. So you see I do the same painting three, four, five, ten times before I feel it's right. And I don't know if I got that when I was in school, that there's a process. I always thought I had to do it perfect the first time, and I think it's really important for children to understand that is absolutely not the case, and it's detrimental attitude when you're trying to do creative work. You have to be willing to make a lot of mistakes. So part of what you uh, are sharing with us this afternoon is not only you know being true to yourself, but have that honest voice, but also know that you grow in your process and your journey as an artist. Exactly, exactly. I did all desert paintings in my first book. I sold a lot of artwork. In fact, the artwork sold before the book. And I painted the second book, it's all ocean work. And I was actually quite afraid that people were gonna say, oh no, I like the desert stuff, you know. Well, the paintings in the second book are, are way more popular than the paintings in the first book. So I just did what I needed to do for the book I was making, and took my chances, oh gosh, are they gonna like my, my underwater stuff? They love it. It's, like I said, I've been way more successful with that artwork. I, although I'm a storyteller and a writer and an author, um, I'm, I'm really a painter, you know, I think underneath, uh, I'm Irish, we tell a lot of stories, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Storytelling was a talent in my, my home, <clears throat> sitting around at the dinner table and talking was entertainment. And uh, getting that on a page is another whole story. Storytelling and writing are two completely different things, and I'm having to learn to write. So that's another whole process. So I think it takes courage to put your stuff on a page and let other people read it. You know, I think kids that do that need to know that takes a lot of guts. You know? Well, thanks for letting us know about the courage it takes behind your work. But I have one last question for you. Now, does Zonk ever have his dream come true? Does he ever get to be a sea turtle? Oh, or do a sea <clears throat> he becomes a sea tortoise. Absolutely. At the end of the first book. And then, of course, he's in the ocean and he has his adventure in the ocean. But he gets homesick. And... He starts looking for the way to get back home, and in the next book, hopefully, he'll get there. So, all right. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. This is fascinating, doing your own uh, weaving. How long have you been doing this? 41 years. Oh. Yeah, my life. <laughs> How did you learn it? Uh, my father. My father uh, saw me 1964. Yeah. Oh. And it's uh, where I'm doing what living, uh, weaving every day. Uh, it's just fascinating watching you work, and it's great to see you actually demonstrating here at the festival. How uh, how do you get inspired for the patterns that you make? Uh, can you repeat? Uh, yeah. How do you get inspired for the actual design of the of what you're weaving? I have, I have the design in my mind. Uh, yeah, a lot of design I got in my mind. Yeah, like this. This is a uh, geometric butterflies. This is my design. This is from my my idea. Yeah. 
It's just amazing that you can keep that in your mind and knowing when to change the different uh, threads and, and how to do it. How does the process actually work so you can end up with a pattern like that as you're, as you're using a loom? You know, when I'm doing weaving, I use a lot of counting. Counting each, each wall, I know how many I have here. And I, I know how, how, how many design I can put here. I can put too, too many, not too many, no, not, not less. Yeah, like I say, I count in each, each work. Yes, and uh, I plan before start to do any kind of design. Yeah, because this, this be 20 by 20. I can make it small, I can make it large. Yeah, they need to be 20 by 20. Now 20 by 20 is what, the, the threads? Or the rocks. The rocks. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yes, uh -huh. 20 inches, yes, 20 inches. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what about the threads themselves? Is that something you make or you buy that, somebody else, the dyes and such? I buy the yarn. I buy a lot of yarn in Texas. I buy a lot of yarn in uh, New Jersey, and I buy a lot of them from my mother in Mexico. You know, that's a wool. That's a sheep wool. You know, I'm, now I'm doing just weaving now. Yes. Now, if I was trying to do something like this, I would think I'd make a mistake. Is there ever where you've made a mistake? Is there a way to fix a mistake while you're doing it? Sometimes, sometimes. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, easy for me. I cut the the, the rocks. Sometimes I have to back back. Back, you know, I have to take everything and I fix the, the you know, the, the wrong place. Yeah, but this, when that's bigger, I have to cut them. It's easy for me. Yeah. Now, uh, do you primarily show your work at festivals or do you share, uh, how else do people find you? I have my studio in Stockton. I have my studio, I have looms, I have uh, four looms, bigger. This is only for demonstration looms. Okay. Yeah, and I do a powwow, Indian show. Uh, last week I was in Vallejo, two days uh, powwow. I do like uh, four powwows a, a year, one year. Yes, but I do more. more I, I'm working my studio every day. Yes. And what's the biggest piece that you would do? How large? How large do you go with the bigger looms? I make one about two years ago, uh, nine wide for 12 feet length. Yeah. Yes, is uh, I have my loom 10 feet wide. Uh, another one is seven. Another one is five. Five feet wide. Do people ever request you to do something with a specific design for them? Yeah, sometime. I have a special order sometime. Yes, sometime. Yeah. And what's the price range for, for the items you sell? I know you've got some smaller pieces. You've got some that have been turned into pillows and some other items. Yeah, like this size, I have this one. I'm making, you know, I don't have any right now, but I sell this $35 for 20 by 20. And the next size is 24 by 40, uh, 85. 85 to 120. Depend on design, what kind of design. And these are all handmade. Yes, uh, hand woven. Yeah, everything is hand woven. It's just a, a, a amazing to appreciate your craftsmanship and, and how you do it. Thank you very much. So when my husband was interviewing you, I out of the corner of my eye, I noticed this piece of work, and it just called to me. And um, you explained to me a little bit about the the type of weaving and its design. This this is a, another kind of weaving, you know, and um, this uh, the design. It's a um, staff of their life and uh, they, they're meeting and uh, together like wife and husband but forever together that's why the design is from from this 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 way you know both one and they never break they never come out come out yeah this is this is design here okay thank you so much <laughs> like sands in the hourglass uh i see you have written a lot of messages in sand sure have tell me a little bit about uh, your booth and what this is all about well I, everybody writes messages in the sand on vacation and they take pictures and i i had done one for my nephew as a christmas present and the person that developed it wanted me to do his niece and then i got another call from a developer there and I thought, well, I'll do it for all my family, and would write their names, take a picture, bring some props, and it just went so well. So then I started in for Valentine's, doing um, orders for Valentine's, and it just, the whole business just took off after that. So do you have a favorite beach you like to go to? I go to the same one in Half Moon Bay, California. Not sure I'm ready to admit where I go in Half Moon Bay. I'm not sure the locals will like that, but it's a public beach, so yeah. Anybody's welcome there. So tell me, um, when you do this, are you using your toes? I know, huh? Everybody wonders that. And they wonder how I get my footprints out. I actually, I have to pay attention to the tides. 
and I have a plastic mat that I stand on and I have a long dowel just that you get at the store 69 cents and I usually carry a clipboard with me because I forget what I need to write once I get there and I have all my messages and I just write them with the stick bent down back up take the picture that's it simple no overhead no nothing just that's it so how many times have your message been washed away before you got a chance to get that picture uh, snapped? It's not so much the amount, it's the birth announcement that got washed away. That was a biggie. But otherwise, you know what? If it does get washed away, it's usually better the second time I do it. So, um, gosh, usually at least once or twice every time I'm there. But, you know, like I said, you learn the tides, but there's still it's still the ocean and it's unpredictable. So I enjoy it. So where do your message come from? Um, you know what? I, I have such a variety because I'm trying to uh, appeal to a large variety, a large audience, and that's what's been the hardest part. But um, if I'm walking around and I go to the beach and do custom orders, so I'll handwrite your message in the sand, whatever you want written. And then while I was there, I was just doodling, waiting for the perfect sunset or the perfect wave. So then I just start writing single words, love, hope, laughter, and... Um, then I got bored with those. So then I started collecting like little sayings that you hear off, you know, you hear all the time on the streets and whatever seems to be the phrase of the month. And so that's where they get. I have a lot of inspirational cards, but what, what's difficult is trying to reach everybody because what you think one person would like, the other person doesn't. And other ones you think who would buy that and people buy it. So go figure. I noticed she had a little bit of humor and now you have a little bit of pets also. I do. I love the humor cards, but I did a, um, I donate to Guide Dogs for the Blind. And so we did a big fundraiser. They have uh, stationery done by me. And um, I just go to dog owners that are sitting on the beach and I say, can I take a picture of your dog with a message on it? And the proceeds go to Guide Dogs and they all are, I've never had one turn me down. So yeah, yeah. A little bit of humor and live pets, it's the best way to go. So. Well, it sounds like messages on the beach, dogs on the beach, you know, and capturing all that definitely gets the essence of it all. It does, yeah. You know, people feel like they're there. And you know what's unique is more people in the other parts of the country are my better seller, like Ohio. A lot of winter, a lot of winter sales, people calling and say, can you do something? I'm snowbound. I'd love a picture of the beach in my living room. And I think those of us that live on the beach or near it, we take it for granted. And so this is just, I don't know why nobody else was doing it, but I am and I don't want anybody else to do it, but they're welcome to it. Public beach, let them do what they want. So yeah. So now do you have a inspiration this month that's been calling you often? No, although I go back to humor. I, I go back to humor. I, I have that. Uh, that's probably one of my better traits. And so I just come up with different sayings. And um, and the reason why I have over 300 is because I get bored with them. And then I put them in the discount bin and start over. So um, no, no, I just see what happens when, when I get there. See what I feel like. So, yeah. so is this your day job? This is my day, night, and morning, and afternoon. This is my every job, everything. But I get a lot of help from family. So that's why my prices are so inexpensive is because I'm not, I, I like a deal, and I, I think other people do too. So I'm not out to make a fortune. I'm just out to make a living and pay my mortgage. But if I do make a fortune, you're not gonna hear me complain, but that, that isn't what keeps me going. So, yeah. So if people weren't here at the Fremont Festival this weekend and they wanted to find out about how to get a handwritten message in the sand or wanted to see more of, a, more of your uh, artwork, mm -hmm. um, where could they go? Well, you can go to my website or I'm also shown um, my cards are sold at the San Jose Art Museum. That's the only place that they, they have exclusive rights right now. I'm going to be at the other arts and wine festivals, but the best way to get a hold of me is through my website. And how, uh, how long would it take for somebody to say, uh, like, you know, all of a sudden they want to do this anniversary oh. card? How long would it take uh, for them to, you know, get on the website, tell you what you want? Yeah, and... it's, only, it's only usually a two-week turnaround. It's really not that bad. It, it, a lot of it has to do with the tides. The tides need to be out when I take the pictures, and then they need to be coming in during daylight. So... I asked for two weeks, doesn't always take that way. There are times where I've had to go overnight because it's a memorial, but two week turnaround is about all they need. So, yeah. Is there one message that's, or one thing that you've done for somebody that's really sticks out in your mind? Probably the wedding proposals. 
the, those are kind of the, the nicest ones. Although I've done a lot of memorials, surprisingly, and you know, people that just love the beach and that's just how they want their names remembered. And so, but the funnest ones are the, the, the wedding proposals. So those are kind of neat, so. It's, it's really fascinating what you do here because once the message gets written in sand, usually it goes away, but you've been found a way to capture it yes, still exactly. and be able to share it with others. I am, yeah, and it's funny how many people come and, and just stand next to me and wonder what I'm doing and, and yeah, everybody seems to be moved by it. So yeah. Well keep it up. I'm looking forward to seeing you around some more. Thanks. I'll be around for as long as I could be here. So thank you for stopping by. Okay. Thank you. How did the Fremont Festival get to be so large? Well, that's a good question. This is our 24th year, and it started out in the Fremont Hub being very small and then uh, grew from there. But we like to think it's our quality of artists and uh, the mix of uh, different uh, entertainment we provide and a number of different things that we offer, offer the festival goers. You know, we've been to quite a few festivals this summer, and this just seems to be one of the biggest ones we've seen. Good variety of artists. How do you uh, allow people to exhibit here? We use an agent that screens our artisans, and they actually jury them, and they have to send in pictures, and they are samples, uh, so that we know exactly what the artisans are going to portray, because it's very important to us to maintain the integrity of the art, so that we're offering a good product to, to the, our guests here. Now, who funds all of this? Well, the festival is funded. It's actually, um, it's funded and the, the expense is borne by the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, a lot of the income comes from um, sponsors of the festival that, that pay that want to be here. And, and the artisans, you know, there's booth fees and things like that. But there's a huge amount of expenses involved and we bear that expense as well. Well, one of the things it seems you spend a lot of money on is the entertainment. And in the years we've been here, it seems like there's always a good variety. Who chooses what entertainment performs? We actually have a committee and we sit down and decide you know, the look and feel that we want of the festival and the audience we want to appeal to and, and uh, is it family friendly, is it going to send the message we want to send and we have a list of bands as we go through them and just keep whittling it down until we find what we want, the mix we want. Speaking of years, since it is the 24th year, are there any big plans for the 25th year next year? Oh gosh, that's a good question. We're looking at a number of different things. Um, Maybe some kind of charity fundraiser. Um, maybe something, changing the music up a little bit. Maybe hosting some kind of after hours event. A lot of different things we're looking at, but what we really want to do is appeal to the community and tell us what they want the 25th festival about because we consider ourselves really to be the um, guardian of the festival. It's really all about the community for the Fremont Chamber. And we really employ the community to to put on this festival so we are appealing to the community to tell us what you want it to look like so we're going to have a section on our website which is fremontfestival.net and people can um, connect contact us and they can tell us what they want to do for the 25th anniversary and if anybody wants to participate as a vendor uh, or any other way they can contact at the festival at that website also yes absolutely it tells you all the contact information for the different facets of the the uh, event so there's different people who manage different parts of it do you limit the number of vendors that you can have here each year well we are limited by the amount of, of actual footprint we have in the city we can only take so many streets but we do have 4.62 miles so that's quite a big festival so we're able to fit quite a few folks in but we are near maxing out, definitely, definitely. We run that danger every year. How many uh, participants do you have as far as exhibitors and how many people do you think est uh, attend over the two days? Well, we currently have about 600 and a little over 650. And the police have given me a, the estimate for today anyway of about 170,000. So that's quite a few people. Considering there's only 209,000 people in Fremont, it's a lot of people. So I noticed that the food booths are run by uh, charitable organizations. How does it affect them in terms of revenue and such? Well, one of the things we pride ourselves on is engaging the community, like I said. And we uh, set up a lot of opportunities for nonprofits to make money at the festival, and the food booths are just one of those. Um, we feel, or we have um, extrapolated that over the 24 years the festival has been in existence, we have been able to help these nonprofits raise over $8 million. It's a big chunk of money for nonprofits for a two day event. So we're real proud about that. And obviously, you know, the, the bigger the crowds, the bigger the, the revenue for that weekend. So, you know, we always try our best to bring them the best crowds we can and hopefully the hungriest. 
Now, one of the things that I, uh, I'm not sure how many years I've been a part of it, but was the fire competition. Uh, how did that get involved with the festival? Oh, that's kind of a funny story. The firefighters came to us and said, we have this great event that we really think would be good at the festival. And they described it to me and I thought, I, 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 why would I care about this? And then they showed me a table. I'm thinking, wow, this is about the community. This would really be an eye opener and they really need to see this. And this is really, we understand what you do and your camaraderie and everything else about your, your career. So um, we, we thought we'd try it a year and it went so well that we signed a three-year contract after that. So we've been having it, hosting it now for four years. Thank you very much. be so easy a caveman can do this now take me through the course okay the course starts out with uh, it's a firefighter combat challenge um, it's all uh, job specific tasks that the firefighters do so they start off with full turnout gear which is about 45 to 50 pounds they put an air pack on that's about 50 pounds and then they start off when the buzzer goes off they throw a hose pack which is about 45 pounds on their shoulders so that's about 130 pounds of equipment on top of a bare body they climb up to the five-story tower, deposit that uh, box into a, a container up there, then pull with a rope another 45-pound hose roll all the way up. Flip it over the top, put it in that same box. They run down the stairs, they have to touch each stair going down. When they get down, they get to a, a, a force entry machine, they call it, it's a Kaiser machine. And it's an eight pound dead blow sledgehammer and they have to move a 165 pound I-beam five feet. So they beat the living heck out of that. They put the hammer down, they run through a delineator to a charged inch and a half hose line, which is about 200 pounds. They drag that 75 feet. When they get done with all of that, they pick up a 185 pound dummy and drag him 100 feet. I guess that's kind of easy as a caveman. <laughs> now, what's the dummy's name? Uh, Rescue Randy is the dummy's name. <laughs> and, and the equipment that they use, is that something they bring themselves? No, we supply everything except their turnout gear. So we have the Scott Air Pack that they put on their back. That's one of our chief sponsors, or the chief sponsor. And um, the mask, of course. All the equipment that's on the course is ours, except their turnout gear. Now tell me, have you done this course? I've done this course for 15 years. I, I was one of the original guys. They, they introduced me as one of the firefighting fossils. That's me. <laughs> And so anybody out there that future firefighters or those who want to come out here and do this, what would you have any advice or what would you recommend? Um, it's, it's not for the, the weak. Um, and I'd say it's probably 70 to 80 percent legs. You really have to train legs and anaerobic exercise. So it, it's there's shape and there's combat shape. And uh, I can tell you I ran marathons prior to doing this and I was not in shape to do this um, before I got here. So it, it really takes a lot of, lot of effort. Excellent. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you very much. So, Walt, tell me, uh, how are you feeling right now? Tired, but uh, I'm pretty satisfied with today's run. And now, how long have you been doing this? Uh, this is actually my 15th season that I've competed at least in a regional event, so 15 consecutive years. Now, the MC said that you're the Cal Ripton of this event. Is that true? Well, the, the event originally hit the West Coast 15 years ago in 92 and I ran in the very first challenge here on the west coast and I've won, run every year since since then. Um, the firefighter challenge is a real significant event in the fire service. It promotes physical fitness and it showcases to the general public the physical demands of the job. So now outside of your training for your job, do you train for this particular event? Well, there's a number of things we do to condition ourselves because this is very <clears throat> anaerobic. So in addition to your typical aerobic uh, training activities, we also go out to the track and run intervals. And then we train, do tower workouts where we break up portions of the course and do multi multiple repetitions of them. Just build up our, our muscular endurance and our lactic acid tolerance. So now I know you talked about, you know, doing this so we can build some more community awareness about how physical demanding your job is, but what do you, for you to do this 15 years, there must be something else that you're doing it for. It's really a great opportunity to do a little bit of traveling, meet firefighters from across the nation and in Canada, and to, uh, to beat them up if you can on the course. But um, 
I've just really enjoyed doing it. This event started as a physical entrance exam for the fire service and firefighters being firefighters, it very quickly launched into a competition of who the fastest firefighters in the world were. So now have you been to the world uh, champion or world event? Sure, we've been to uh, several world events and the team that I'm a member of, I'm on team two now when I was team one, our best uh, world finish was third overall in the world. That's amazing. So now how many countries usually compete in the world? There's roughly about 500 teams between the United States and Canada that compete annually. And the top 22 fastest in the world qualify for the final day of the world championships. So in terms of your circuit, uh, where, where are you traveling or how many events are you competing in, say, within a given year? We'll travel or we'll compete in uh, really all that's required is a regional event. And then if you qualify, you advance to the world championships. And, but there'll be 100 plus teams at the world championships that qualify. So to be competitive, you need to hit a couple of events. This is our second event this year. We plan on going to the nationals in Atlanta and then on to the worlds in Las Vegas in November. Excellent. So you must be just a great example to your team. They must look up to you in a lot of ways. Well, I'm usually Mr. Irrelevant, our fourth or fifth time now, our top three runs comprise our team score but i enjoy doing it i know it's what keeps me motivated and fit for my job so i plan on continuing to do it throughout my career now you said your personal be best has been this year in the terms of the competition no my personal best was a number of years ago when i was a little younger before i entered the over 40 division but uh i uh, ran a 144 and a handful of times in the 40s but today i ran a 154 which was one second off of the current over 40 state mark, which is held by a Fremont firefighter, Matthew Sunberg, I believe. That's amazing. Now, I noticed you had some support out here. You have a number one fan with you. Yeah, I have my son, Jackson. He loves the challenge. Um, you really can't pull him out of the stands. He likes to watch every race. So we're lucky to even get him here for this interview. <laughs> so Jackson, tell me, what do you think about your dad today? He did really good and I like the way he beat him. Uh -huh. The guy that he burst. Yeah, now do you see yourself doing this one day? Maybe. Yeah? There's a possibility. Uh, yeah, now what do you think about carrying that? Uh, do you have like a dog you practice with to carry it across the room like that? No. <laughs> so, what part do you like the best? Do you like to see him um, use the fire hose or climb up the tower? Um, both. Both? Great. Great, Jackson. So, yeah, you're proud of your dad today? Yeah. Well, that's great that he has you out here to support him all the way. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. No, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to cover this event. It helps all of us promote this sport. They talked about at the beginning of this event that you are the founder of this? Well, the creator, if you will, yeah. Um, uniquely, uh, we are the only uh, university-based, federally funded research grant that turned into a nationally televised sports event. And uh, this was a funding initiative from the U.S. Fire Administration to the University of Maryland to look at the physiological requirements of firefighting. So we quantified what is firefighting, but the criterion that we used is essentially the engine of the Firefighter Combat Challenge. And that was in 1975 and 76. So it started with a grant? It did, yes. And so has the event evolved and changed? You know, obviously it's changed from the drill tower at the, at the University of Maryland to a sports event like you see it. But, uh, I mean, we've made some refinements along the way and we tweak the rules a little bit from year to year. But basically this has been pretty much the same thing now for 17 straight years. So now how has it evolved into a world competition as well? Well, um, you know, in this digital age, uh, there are no secrets. And um, uh, fire departments from around the world have become aware of uh, this event and subsequently um, are interested in starting their own challenges. So in uh, March, I went to New Zealand and they have now a national team, a national competition. I was there for their first event and they'll be sending a team to Las Vegas. Um, in, um, let's see, it was in June, I was in South Africa and uh, similarly we had the first uh, challenge there so uh, uh, and, and that and so on and so forth so it's, it's, it's basically we think this will become truly a worldwide event so through your creation uh, 
this is probably like your wildest streets of how it's just um, created such a uh, community event and um, why do you think this is good? Well, first off, um, I think that there's a certain commonality around the world with firefighters uh, in that uh, there's, there's a clear identity. And the, the tasks that firefighters do are pretty much the same. I mean, we all use water to put fires out and we rescue people. So um, the, the appeal, if you will, is built in. It's sort of endemic in being a firefighter. So in that, in that sense, it's not all that surprising. And, and I think firefighters are a very competitive uh, bunch of people. So now, um, you weren't a firefighter, or were you? Yeah, I was. I, I joined the fire department in 1966. Okay, so I was thinking maybe your background was in kinesiology or physiology. Or well, that too. I mean, I, I went on to get my doctorate uh, in kinesiology, and so um, I was very interested in the scientific side. But I also recognized that uh, fitness is an integral part of being a, a good firefighter. And so that appeal, or at least having this kind of a platform that allows firefighters to demonstrate their skills, is a natural outgrowth of the research. Now, in terms of the uh, recovery part of it at the end of the event, um, that seems very important. Well, this is, uh, as we say, a very anaerobic event. It's a lot of work done in a very short period of time. And it's quite important in terms of recovery that the firefighters keep moving because uh, alternatively, if you don't, you have a lot of pu a p a pooling of blood in the lower extremities, which will delay your, your, uh, your response. So we highly encourage people to continue. In fact, um, the best way to recover, believe it or not, is get out of your bunker gear as quickly as possible, put on your running shoes and go for a very slow jog, believe it or not. Well, that's amazing. Now, I... Do you, does anybody take that recommendation? You know, I see a few guys. I mean, uh, it, it kind of depends on where you are in the, in the whole training paradigm. And we've got guys that do this, and I, I don't want to say it's routine, but they're able to give an interview at the finish line. And then others, of course, they're not as well prepared that think you, you know, that you should be thought of as crazy to make such a suggestion. Now, tell me about the, uh, is there age classes? Yes, there are age groups. Um, the age groups start at 40. And uh, we now have uh, sufficient numbers within the classes to create a 45 and above at the finals, a 50 and then a 55 and above. And we have a few 60-year-olds too, but there's never been enough of them to form an actual uh, category. So now in the team competition, how does that work? Uh, what we do is we have uh, up to five members on a team and we add the top uh, fastest three times to give you a team total. And then it's nothing more than a ranking when we're all done. And so tell me, have you ever uh, done this event? Oh, I, yeah, I, I did. The, I was the first guy to ever do it. And um, I did this at the University of Maryland, and subsequently we, we have validated this in a number of different jurisdictions. But uh, it's been a while since I've actually gone out here and, and done this. Um, and I, I wouldn't recommend that to anybody uh, without some sort of training. And though even though I, I work out every day, it's not specific to, to this. So the very strong admonition that we give to everybody is that, you know, don't think of this thing casually. You need to be prepared before you come out here and do it. So now where does the funding come from now? I'm sure grants come and go. Yeah, we are uh, funded through our sponsors, our national sponsors, and specifically Scott Health and Safety, which is the title sponsor of the Firefighter Combat Challenge. And then we have other companies like Lion Apparel, uh, Hearst, the, um, you know, the uh, Jaws of Life people. Uh, we have uh, Streamlight uh, Flashlights, a uh, uh, very big sponsor, longtime uh, supporter. Lion Apparel has been with us almost since the beginning of time. And then uh, joining, um, uh, joining us this year has been uh, uh, the boot uh, made by uh, Magnum Ford Globe, a very, very uh, excellent product that I think everybody is, you know, sort of enviously looking at now. So. Yeah, our, our national sponsors are, are very, very important. And then when we come to an event like this, the host does also help uh, provide the short short funding to make this a reality. Now, how many cities within a given year um, will the challenge go to? Uh, we'll be in uh, tw uh, 20 or 21 this year, counting the finals. And the finals consist of like at one city stop? Yeah, actually what we have, we have a U.S. national championship that takes place in Clayton County, Georgia, which is... 10 minutes from the, the Atlanta airport. 
And uh, then about, I think, two and a half, three weeks later, we're in Las Vegas. We'll be on Fremont Street under the canopy. Yeah, that's going to be a big deal. Now, how do the firefighters get there? Do they get funding themselves, or is this something personally you that know, they, they do? Yeah, you know, it's, it's um, I guess uh, you could say that there's almost as many different funding mechanisms as there are teams. Uh, some of the departments are uh, uh, completely funded, and then we have others that these guys are doing this all out of their own pocket. So it's, it's, uh, it's every permutation between there and the other place. I had another question for you. Now, I saw some women competing today now. Um, have women always been a part of this event? Yeah, I, th I think we've had women from the beginning. Um, they don't represent a substantial percentage of the active fire service. I think the number may be 3% of all firefighters are females, and that's about the same as what we see here. Now, in terms of, you know, your personal best, and I know people are kind of going after that, um, what do they... Do they win something? Do they get a trophy? Or is it just personal recognition that they're well, out for? I, I don't think anybody's in here for the baubles or the bling. Uh, but I mean, the, the, the package that they will win here for today is a very nice one. They'll get, if, if they place in the top three, they'll get a medal. Corresponding, it's not a solid gold medal, but they have a gold, silver, and a bronze. Uh, they will receive a nice, very nice, um, uh, embossed uh, plaque, and uh, I think the thing they like the most is this uh, 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 D.E. Williams makes a very nice helmet shield, which is mounted on a plaque. So those, that, that's a package that's you know, worth a couple hundred bucks, but uh, I think most of this comes from a sense of pride. And teams come out here and build that pride, and that's what you've been doing out here, and it's just great that you're doing this, and and that's it's just lasts as long as it does. And I hope, you know, years down the line, we're going to come back here and see it some more. Well, I can tell you, um, I've got ideas yet to um, improve, if you will, substantially the, the visibility of the Firefighter Combat Challenge in the general community. I mean, within the fire service, I, I think you'd almost have to be brain dead to be unaware that this event exists. But uh, I can tell you that um, we're, we're, we're only part way there. This is, this is going to get a, bit, a lot, lot bigger. Excellent. Well, I hope it does. Thank you very much. Thank you. Joni, what do you think about the women who competed in the fire challenge? They were very impressive. It's good to see both men and women being representative as firefighters. Watching the fire challenge was a great experience, but I also enjoyed meeting some of the festival's artists. I wish I could create art from just a piece of wire. I'm glad that person who created her art by writing in the sand was back again this year. I remember discovering her during last year's festival and enjoyed learning about her work. I was impressed with the weaver he met, and I know you were too since you bought one of his rugs. Between the hundreds of artists, the great food and the many musical performance, it's no wonder Fremont's festival is the biggest and largest street festival on the West Coast. I'm Rich. And I'm Joni. We're always looking for fun. And we hope we brought you some. Because we're, we're the, the fun, fun addicts. Yeah. Thanks for watching. For more information, please visit our website, funaddicts.tv.